Do it. I love All right, let's go right to work. Apparently, you're not happy with the direction of Disney and Bob Iger. So you you think? Really apparently, like apparently. I want to get yeah. a sense of what you uh, think is fortunate and unfortunate about the current situation at Disney and the board. First, let me tell you, I want to say good morning to David and to Carl, and thank you for having us here today. You know, today is an important day. We filed our preliminary proxy statement, and we opening our website, which is Restore the Magic. And we did all that, Jim, because we love Disney. You know, we love Disney, and it saddens me that the board didn't welcome me because our goal is just to work with them, to help them, and to help them make the company better, which, frankly, we have a, a history of doing. You know, what was interesting, Jim, is last week we went, seven of us from Tryon. I love this. Went to Disney World in Orlando. And it was fascinating because we went not the way board, directors, family, friends go. We didn't have any special passes. We didn't have any tour guides. We didn't have any leg breakers. Le leg breakers. <laughs> we didn't have any line breakers. We didn't have any leg I love that one, leg breakers. And it might have been if you sent after by Bob Iger if they knew they were there when they went. <laughs> breakers either. And everybody, everybody was nice. I mean. Look at pelts in those shades, man. <laughs> This, he sets himself up though is hilarious. It's like this punchline that he sets himself up for. Oh yeah. Magic Kingdom and the Hollywood Studios were terrific. The people were wonderful. All the employees were smiling, and that's probably in a, in large part because they didn't own any Disney stuff. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so, uh, Even Kramer and them couldn't help it. They just they busted out on that one. It's like yeah. Damn it! <laughs> got him! Got him! Um, but he's Do you not think wrong. he did that on the fly, or he had like prepared that? I think that might have been a little. He, he was probably thinking about that while he was in Disney World. He's like, "Look, the staff yeah. is great. The cast is wonderful." And somebody probably said, "Well, Nelson, they don't own any shares." You know, it's like, "Ah, I'm going to use that one." I can, I can see that happening. But you know, it's it. The interview goes on. We'll play a little bit more of this. And we'll take a break. Yeah, that's the problem here, Jim. This company is just not being run properly the board oversight is is awful straight up the board oversight is awful what does he mean by that the board lets bob Iger do whatever the hell he wants to do a board is supposed to steer help steer the direction of a company on the broad scope a company is supposed to keep a ceo in check but in this case they're rubber stamping it's like no, nothing is working. Why isn't the board really turning the screws and saying some direction has to change substantially? They're not. Uh, it really is. Uh, the park, certain, as I said, certain rides were great, but you can see it's getting a bit long in the tooth. They need more capital invested. They need more capital invested now because the competition is getting keener. You've got Comcast opening 500 acres right down the road in two years with a brand new park. They're also opening parks in Chicago, opening uh, a park in Texas. He meant Las Vegas. He's going to correct himself. Uh, pardon me, not Chicago, Las but, Vegas. And and these the, 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 this is where all the value today in the stock price resides. But, but Nelson, that's an important point he makes. And because again, he seems to come to the same conclusion that a lot of others have. People ask about the Disney stock price. Of course, they've got it up there live when he was doing this interview. I think it was Thursday morning or Wednesday morning. Um, the valuation of the Walt Disney Company, according to folks like Nelson, uh, and, and not just him, but others, it largely rests in the value of the theme park operations. Like there's no premium on the stock price for, or not much, I'm not going to say any. There's no premium on the stock price for, say, linear broadcast because there's fear of, of it backtracking. But if you look at the park operations and you, you look at like a, a normal price value, earnings per share, you look at what the theme parks are generating year over year, the value is mostly there what the market has priced Disney at at $90 a share. It's mostly in the theme parks. 
even Disney seems to think that, right? That the the, the investment that they announced was in the theme park, sixty billion dollars. That's what yeah. they're. But all yeah. overseas, right? Overwhelmingly Most, overseas. From what they have given us so far, Ron, yes, it seems overwhelmingly overseas. The small grouping of slides when they announced this a few months ago was showing pictures of ninety percent or more. It might have been almost every one of them except one. Matter of fact, showing the the construction or the expansion or operations all in foreign territories of of uh, of uh, resorts and uh, timeshares the disney vacation club really didn't even talk much about the parks in in foreign territories they're talking about expanding their resort footprint it seems like more than anything um so that's that's what nelson's talking about is is that you know where's the value for espn where's the value for disney plus and streaming and everything else it's just it's not reflected in the stock price because apparently people don't think there is it uh, i understand well, I from the background ob to obvious that disney plus doesn't have any value yeah. Just Wait, look at that up, compared sorry. to Netflix. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's very obvious that they don't see value in Disney Plus because otherwise it would be probably somewhere around where Netflix is. I mean, because Netflix is just the streaming service for the most part. Netflix is is like, if, if you look at uh, Netflix's uh, P to E ratio, price to earnings, it's it's stratospherically high still. So, I mean, I think Netflix, you know, some would argue that Netflix might be overpriced. But yes, at the same time, how the market looks at things, he's right. right. And I think Nelson Peltz does even make a comparison well, either in this segment yeah. or the next when it comes to the, Netflix. The, the yeah. one thing I want to say before we hit the play button again mm -hmm. is I want people to pay attention to the way that Peltz is speaking. Mm -hmm. Because when you have someone of his pedigree, when you have someone of his business acumen, the way that he would typically speak is not the way that he's speaking in this interview, in my estimation. I think that he is speaking in sort of a populist manner to reach out to the vast number of uh, investors who maybe they have 10, 15, 20, 50, whatever, you know, stocks in Disney. Mm -hmm. They're not the institutional investors. But he needs a wide swath of those individuals to come over to him to battle against the institutionalists if he's going to win this proxy by battle either this year or next year or the year thereafter. So he's got to convince a huge number of people out there that you're getting 6% return, so you're, you're probably not even keeping, keeping up with inflation really, versus these other major S&P 500 companies which are getting far, far better returns. And the way that he's doing that is to go back 10, 15 years and say, You've never received what you should have out of this company because the legacy of Bob Iger is one of facades alone. There's nothing behind it. It's all glitz and glimmer and pixie dust up front, but behind it, mm -hmm. there's no margin here. So that's, yeah. I, that, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're subscribed to Valiant Renegade and join us every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show.